welcome to this exploring session and today we are looking at Galatea by John Lilly. This is a, a play we're going to be doing over two sessions as most uh, plays by Lilly are, uh, are quite short. Uh, uh, potentially structural reasons why they are uh, reasonably uh, manageable in a couple of sessions, which is always delightful uh, as opposed to plays that uh, uh, I've been I've been doing some work uh, preparing for the future. And the closer you get to the 17th century, the more sessions you need to look at a play. It's getting to the point where five sessions is just not a week's just not going to be enough uh, when we go into the 17th century. So I'm quite happy that we're still quite snug in uh, in the end of the 16th. So uh, where we can we can manage a couple of plays a week, and it's all all cheerful and jolly uh, uh, when we're doing uh, cheerful and jolly plays. Uh, anyway, Galatea uh, follows on fairly swiftly from the two John Lilly plays that we have already done. We've looked at Campaspe and Sappho and Feo, and this play might have been written very much hot on the heels. There's a little bit of questions whether this is a play written for the same uh, company that was uh, doing those plays, uh, uh, sometimes you know, the Oxford Boys, uh, in around 1584, or whether this play sort of stretches out and sort of is appended to uh, the uh, uh, Paul's Boys uh, a few years uh, later down the line, uh, or whether it's sort of both and, uh, and, and, and how that, that sort of works. That's one for future research and, and discussion. Uh, but broadly speaking, it follows hot on the heels from the two plays we've already done and or precedes hot on the heels of the plays that we're going to do in the future. So that should be uh, nice to get a sense of uh, artistic progression is sort of the idea. We're trying to read uh, Lily's plays in cr uh, approximate chronological order. Um, there are some problems with that a little later on. Uh, but uh, for the moment, it is nicely straightforward. Reading the play today, uh, we have assembled this wonderful crack team of readers. So reading uh, the prologue as well as Rafe today is. Aliki Chapel. I'm an actor, translator and theatre maker based in the north of England. Uh, we also reading uh, a Titerus and Toulouse today is. Hello, I'm Helen Good. I'm a historian and I'm stuck in Yorkshire. And uh, reading Cupid, Dick and Ramia today is. Hello, I'm Sarah Blake. I'm an actor, writer and director based in Germany. Uh, reading uh, one of the nymphs. We've, there's lots of nymphs. Some of them are named nymphs, but reading a nymph and also Diana, uh, who's in charge generally of, of all nymph uh, welfare, is... Hello, my name's Elizabeth Amissu and I'm also based in Romford. And reading uh, the title character Galatea today is... Alexandra, and I'm suddenly terrified because I thought I was mythologically very well prepared, but it was for a different Galatea. <laughs> <laughs> Other Galateas are available. Uh, reading uh, Melibius and the Alchemist is... Hi, I'm Alan Scott. I'll try and mine some Philosopher's Gold. Uh, reading Philida and Neptune today is... Hi, I'm Lois. I'm a retired academic embedded in London. Uh, reading a Mariner and Eurota today is... Hi, I'm Eric, and apparently I'm going to be very grumpy and very in love today, which is two feelings that I've had before. Excellent. All at once or one at a time, we'll find out in a moment. And reading Robin and Peter is... Hello, my name's Francis Cox. I'm an actor living in Amsterdam. And I'm your host, Robert Crichton. I will be reading stage directions, uh, what ones that we have. Uh, it's fair to say that there are a lot of inferred uh, stage directions in place occasionally um, in uh, in some of these texts, uh, but uh, there isn't an awful lot in the original printing uh, in terms of clues. Uh, so uh, we may be adding stage directions or uh, negotiating them as we go. But uh, the play starts. We have a prologue. Uh, and so let's uh, take it away. Prologuing. Eos and Smyrna were two sweet cities, the first named of the violet, the latter of the myrrh. Homer was born in the one and buried in the other. Your majesty's judgment and favor are our sun and shadow, the one coming of your deep wisdom, the other of your wanted grace. We in all humility desire that by the former receiving our first breath, we may in the latter take our last rest. Augustus Caesar had such piercing eyes that whoso looked on him was constrained to wink. Your Highness hath so perfect a judgment that whatsoever we offer, we are enforced to blush. Yet 
as the Athenians were most curious that the lawn wherewith Minerva was covered should be without spot or wrinkle, so have we endeavoured with all care that we present your highness should neither offend in scene nor syllable, knowing that as in the ground where gold groweth, nothing will prosper but gold. So in your majesty's mind, where nothing doth harbour but virtue, nothing can enter but virtue. And thus ends the prologue. Um, slightly different in, in, in uh, theme from the, to a degree, the, uh, the er earlier prologues we've had, even before uh, the Queen's Majesty, of uh, this one's very, very arse-licky, right from the off, um, has to be said, laying this one on really thick. Um, uh, any thoughts on that, or on this prologue generally? Um, it's obviously very site-specific, so it's not as heavily a prologue that well, we would... Uh, necessarily used in a modern performance, but uh, maybe there's some f nice things in there that we want to dig out. Any any thoughts on that before we go into the rest of the play proper? It's a Monday. I have to prod really hard <laughs> sometimes to just wake everyone up. Um, silly thoughts as well as serious ones are perfectly allowed. Uh, Lois? Yeah, well, I don't think it really is usable now unless... You'd almost have to send it up and do it in a really groveling style or something. But you really can't blame uh, the poor man for writing like that. I mean, given what would happen if the queen didn't like it and, and given that he was hoping to get the post of Master of the Revels at some point. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, I, I do quite like the idea of an, uh, appointing someone to be official queen for some of these, you know, for, for mm -hmm. a performance, you know, you get, you mm -hmm. get, the, you get, they can, they can arrive, uh, you have a costume, uh, you know, they, they, when they book their tickets, you get your measurements, there's a costume waiting for you, you get doled up and you get the best seat in the house, mm -hmm. uh, and so that these things can be done and that there's a little bit of role play for the audience there. I, I, I think that's very doable. And yes, then you could slightly send it up and really, really. Uh, see what that queen particularly does as well. Um, uh, Aliki. Can be the top prize in your crowdfunder. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I seriously think that's a, that's a viable option. <laughs> uh, okay. I don't think there's much, uh, much to grab uh, additionally on that for the moment. So let's move on to Act 1, Scene 1. Uh, so we have uh, uh, Titerus and Galatea. Galatea. Uh, Agatha, disguised as a boy, is an inferred direction here. The sun doth beat upon the plain fields. Wherefore, let us sit down, Galatea, under this fair oak, by whose broad leaves, being defended from the warm beams, we may enjoy the fresh air which softly breathes from humble floods. Father, you have devised well, and whilst our flock doth roam up and down this pleasant green, you shall recount to me, if it please you, for what cause this tree was dedicated unto Neptune, and why you have thus disguised me. <laughs> I do agree thereto, and when thy state and my care be so considered, thou shalt know this question was not asked in vain. I willingly attend. In times past, where thou seest a small heap of a heap of small pebble, stood a stately temple of white marble, which was dedicated to the god of the sea, and in right right being so near the sea. Hither came all such as either ventured by long travel to see countries, or by great traffic to use merchandise offering sacrifice by fire to get safely by water, yielding thanks for perils past and making prayers for good success to come. But fortune, constant in nothing but inconstancy, did change her copy as the people their custom. For the land, being oppressed by Danes, who instead of sacrifice committed sacrilege, instead of religion rebellion, and made a prey of that in which they should have made their prayers, tearing down the temple even with the earth, being almost equal with the skies, enraged so the God who binds the winds and the hollows of the earth, that he caused the seas to break their bounds, so if men had broke their vows, and to swell as far above their reach as men had swerved beyond their reason. Then might you see ships sail where sheep fed, 
Anchors cast where ploughs go, fishermen throw their nets where husbandmen sow their corn, and fishes throw their scales where fowls do breed their quills. Then might you gather froth where now is dew, rotten weeds for sweet roses, and take view of monstrous mermaids instead of passing fair maids. To hear these sweet marvels, I would mine eyes were turned also into ears. But at the last, our countrymen repenting, and not too late, because the last Neptune either weary of his wrath or weary to do them wrong, upon condition consented to ease their miseries. What condition will not miserable men accept? The condition was this, that at every five years day, the fairest and chastest virgin in all the country should be brought unto this tree, and here being bound, whom neither parentage shall excuse for honour nor vice for integrity, was left for a peace offering unto Neptune. Dear is the peace that is bought with guiltless blood. I am not able to say that, but he sendeth a monster called the Agar, against whose coming the waters roar, the fowls fly away, and the cattle in the field for terror shun the banks. And she bound to endure that horror. And she bound to endure that horror. Does this monster devour her? Whether she be devoured of him, or conveyed by Neptune, or drowned between both, it is not permitted to know, and incurreth danger to conjecture. Now, Galatea, here endeth my tale, and beginneth thy tragedy. Alas, father, and why so? I would thou hadst been less fair, or more fortunate, then shouldst thou not, then shouldst thou not repine that I have disguised thee in this attire, for thy beauty will make thee to be thought worthy of this God, to avoid therefore destiny, for wisdom ruleth the stars, I think it better to use an unlawful means, your honour preserved, than intolerable grief, both life and honour hazarded, and to prevent, if it be possible, thy constellation by my craft. Now hast thou heard the custom of this country, the cause why this tree was dedicated unto Neptune, and the vexing care of thy fearful father. Father, I have been attentive to hear, and by your patience, am ready to answer. Destiny may be deferred, but not prevented, and therefore it were better to offer myself in triumph than to be drawn to it with dishonour. Hath nature, as you say, made me so fair above all, and shall not virtue make me as famous as others? Do you not know, or doth over-carefulness make you forget, that an honourable death is to be preferred before an infamous life? I am but a child and have not lived long, and yet not so childish as I desire to live ever, virtues I mean to carry to my grave, not grey hairs. I would I were as sure that destiny would light on me, as I am resolved it could not fear me. Nature hath given me beauty, virtue courage. Nature must yield me death, virtue honour. Suffer me, therefore, to die for which I was born, or let me curse that I was born, sith I may not die for it. Alas, Galatea, to consider the causes of change. Thou art too young, and that I should find them out for thee too, too fortunate. The destiny to me cannot be so hard as the disguising hateful. To gain love, the gods have taken shape of beasts. To save life, art thou coy to take the attire of men? They were beastly gods that lust could make them seem as beasts. In health, it is easy to counsel the sick, but it is hard for the sick to follow wholesome counsel. Well, let us depart, 
The day is far spent. And they exit. And who knows whether the the stated tree is is left in place or whether that that that, that is uh, removed uh, in some fashion. Uh, we will be keeping tabs on the location of the tree as uh, as the reading uh, progresses. Um, it's it's fairly obvious to uh, state that yes, this is an exposition heavy scene. The the, the big challenge is is making. Uh, it seem uh, reasonable that Galatea doesn't know uh, the backstory uh, already. Um, but uh, there's enough at stake, I think, uh, for this to, to, to work well. And the nice thing about having an exposition heavy opening scene is it gets the exposition out of the way. Uh, and now we can get on with the play. And I actually don't inherently have a problem with that um it's just uh, you've got to be aware that you've got to do this well uh otherwise uh, you're you you are in trouble uh, in a way that a, a big opening dramatic scene is uh, is slightly easier to to get away with um but uh, uh tight uh, uh exposition monkey very much here um and, uh, and 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 delivering you know a quite a terrifying tale it's um there's some there's some all sorts of questions here, and also how Galatea re responds to the situation as well is really interesting. Thoughts on the room? I don't want to start too much from me. Mm -hmm. Let's let's see what else comes out of the room. Thoughts? Thoughts on Galatea? Thoughts on 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 uh, Titus? Thoughts on the plan? Thoughts on the world that we are living in? Um, thoughts on Neptune? I don't know. Any thoughts you want to throw in, uh, Alexandra? I have an, uh, a thought on the structure of this scene because we've got all that exposition. We've got this is a problem. This is how what we're doing to avoid it. Let's not do it anyway. Should we go over there? Um, <laughs> it, that that seems to me how 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 those last few last four or five lines uh, seem to suddenly uh, shift direction. And yes, I think again that's that's something that. Once you've worked so hard to persuade your audience to just just leave their expectations on the side and and pay attention to the exposition, to then suddenly throw them out of that needs to be handled delicately. Yeah, it's like we we, we have done the exposition. We must now exit. <laughs> um, the, there is a quality of that, Sarah. Um, I put in the chat that uh, it's like, oh, is this going to turn into Clash of the Titans by the Humber? Um, and I, I do think that that sort of trope of, you know, the gods punishing a, a, a place by by taking the, the the most beautiful woman and sacrificing her to Neptune or who or whoever, I do think that that's a, that's a well that's still a well known enough trope through mainly through Hollywood films that you could actually play with this quite nicely like if you if you if you had like maybe you could use shadow puppetry or real puppetry perhaps or or a video installation or something to sort of mark out the story um of what neptune did and why the sacrifice occurs i i think you'd probably get most of the audience on board with that straight away because they just look at those shapes and it would be quite familiar to them and they'd be like ah oh, yeah you know i think there's i think a modern audience could still key into this story really easily and and they they'd sort of know where they were and they'd be they'd be up for the adventure um it did just, it did just really make me smile though right at the beginning um that uh galatia or, or or whatever her name is i'm not sure how you pronounce her name she she's like oh father Tell me about this tree, and also, why am I in disguise? And I thought that was just really funny priorities because you think, given that she doesn't know the story, you'd think her first priority would be like, why am I, why am I dressed like a boy? Um, but no, no, she's more interested in the tree, which you know turns out to be useful for for the plot. Um, and I, the the other thing I am wondering is is why. You know, if, if we're talking about all powerful gods here, um, surely if she just dons man's attire, they're still going to know who she is. Or maybe I'm just not supposed to ask that question. 
I'm we may sure. not be supposed to ask lots of questions okay. and maybe that's, that's part of our challenge um and, and but yes i think the idea that you can you can illustrate the story that is being told even with quite simple effects just simply dimming the lights when the mention of god sort of t uh, appearing and maybe sound effects and it doesn't actually have to be too big but it could be all sorts of big uh all sorts of big uh uh, things could be done. I mean, I think that's the nature of this kind of opening. Let me tell you a story. It invites play on that level. Lots of hands. I'm going to go to Lois first, then Eric, then Aliki. You no, know, what's quite interesting about this is that although the characters have these classical names and sound like something out of Virgil, this is all apparently happening in Yorkshire, somewhere like that. I mean, they're by the Humber. Um, and moreover, there's a reference to the Danish invasion. In fact, I can't make out why Neptune is blaming all the local people if it was the Danes that were causing all the trouble uh but maybe they're they're danish i don't know uh it, it seemed like a rather odd situation i mean the other striking thing is just what an incredibly virtuous young woman this is i mean how you know you just can't get more noble dutiful you know <laughs> lovable than she is wow <laughs> Yes, her reaction to the situation is really, really interesting. And that I think there's a lot to dig in that, which we, we may get into in a moment. But maybe people are going to say things like that. Uh, Erica Leakey, then Alan, I think. I was going to say that in like response to Sarah's point about the tree and the clothing, it's sort of that like hangover brain where you're like, what? What what's this tree? Why? Why? <laughs> what? What am I wearing? Uh, <laughs> but also... Um, I find it interesting how Galatea's um, later speech is uh, that she wants to be virtuous and sort of, as Lois just said, uh, because it seems like honor seems to be something that men are mostly concerned with, not women. And the fact that she's disguised as a boy also might be, um, I don't know, not a clue, but sort of an interesting point to think about. Yeah, yeah, the impression that, yeah, maybe she uh, gr grabbed out of bed first thing in the morning and, uh, you know, just put these on and come with me. And why am I near a tree? Uh, just woken up, still dew in the eyes. Uh, Aliki, then Alan. Um, OK, so I just, I just have to say this now. Uh, I, the way she talks, it's she talks like uh, Iphigenia. Mm. Exactly that. And I wonder if that what Lily is thinking. It's got, oh, Greek girl by the sea, need a sacrifice. She's with her dad. I know who talks that way. <laughs> um, <laughs> but what I had raised my hand for in the beginning was I really enjoy this speech of Titarus's which we're all being a bit unkind about. Um, I really like all the contrasts in it. Instead of sacrifice, sacrilege, instead of religion, rebellion, where the sheep fed now, anchors cast, where plows go. It's great. I love it. Yes, I mean, the, th the thing is, it, we, we can't disguise the fact that, that you know, this is an exposition uh, scene, but it is a well-written one in that <laughs> sense, you know, in the sense that the author is, 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 is clearly wanting to, to get it done and do it beautifully. Uh, is, I, I think, a perfectly reasonable sentiment. Uh, Alan? Yeah, I must admit, I'm slightly puzzled as to why the Humber is featuring so heavily, because these it's effectively a straight Mediterranean mythological origin. Um, I did put in the chat, I wonder whether the initial production was sponsored by the Hull Tourist Board. <laughs> no, 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 this is not Hull. This is Lincolnshire, they're the enemy. Mm. Yes, yes, <laughs> well, yes. Well, it's to the side of the river, isn't it? Well, exactly, that's why they're the enemy. Um... <laughs> This is the this is the law of neighbor, uh, insulting your neighbours, you know, and uh, and uh, yeah, the, the, like, if, you, like if, you're, if you're on the other side of a border, they are the enemy. Then like us in Norfolk, yeah, uh, yeah, Suffolk and Norfolk, uh, you know, all all of these bordering, uh, it's 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 all fair game. Um, anyway, I think we're drifting from the point, uh, and and the question of actually how much the location is specified and to how often is is uh, an interesting question that we may come to as well. Um, very briefly, Eric, before we go into the next scene. Well, also it's interesting how it's like that play we did last week where um, it's sort of very death oriented, sort of uh, going virtue, uh, nature hath given me beauty, virtue, courage, and then nature must deal with me death and virtue honor so it's like well since i'm gonna die i might as well die in with vir like sort of honorably or at least i don't know it depends how you read that i guess having achieved honor 
Right, so we have uh, we, we we didn't get to see uh, uh, King Kong, but we've had the the the, the establishing shots uh, for that in place. We're going to go to Act One, Scene Two, and here we have a, a little scenette between Cupid and a nymph of Diana. A nymph, are you strayed from your company by chance, or love you to wander solitarily on purpose? Fair uh, boy, or god, or whatever you be, I would you leave these woods unto me so well known that I cannot stray though I would, and my mind so see that to be melancholy I have no cause. There is none of Diana's train that, can, that any can train, either out of their way or out of their wits. What is that Diana, a goddess? What her nymphs, virgins, what her pastimes, hunting? A goddess? Who knows it not? Virgins? Who thinks it not? Hunting? Who loves it not? I pray thee, sweet wench, amongst all your sweet troop, is there not one that followeth the sweetest thing, sweet love? Enough, good sir. What mean you by it? Or what do you call it? A heat full of coldness, a sweet full of bitterness, a pain full of pleasantness, which maketh thoughts have eyes and hearts ears, bred by desire, nursed by delight, weaned by jealousy, killed by dissembling, buried by ingratitude. And this is love. Fair lady, will you any? If it be nothing else, it is but a foolish thing. Try, and you shall find it a pretty thing. I have neither will nor leisure, but I will follow Diana in the chase, whose virgins are all chaste, delighting in the bow that wounds the swift heart in the forest, not fearing the bow that strikes the soft heart in the chamber. This difference is between my mistress Diana and your mother, as I guess, Venus, that all her nymphs are amiable and wise in their kind, the other amorous and too kind for their sex, and so farewell, little god. And exit the nymph. Diana and thou and all thy shall know that Cupid is a great god. I will practice a while in these woods and play such pranks with these nymphs that while they aim to hit others with their arrows, they shall be wounded themselves with their own eyes. Exit Cupid. Uh, what an interesting scene. Uh, yes, yeah, so we got Cupid, the ambassador of love, uh, randomly and uh, uh, unconsentingly sent, um, and uh, nymph, uh, 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 and or, or, uh, the nymphs of Diana, all of whom uh, are, are are quite uh, not non love centric. Uh, I think it would be fair to say not not desperately interested. In it. So you've got a love peddler, um, and this sort of interview interrogation. Uh, I'm very taken on uh, Cupid saying uh, love being a pretty thing. Uh, uh, love is a, a, a prick, love is a sting, love is a pretty, pretty thing. Uh, George Peel, uh, The Hunting of Cupid, which comes from around about the same time as this. So uh, always interested by, uh, by uh, crossovers there. Uh, tr conventional turns of phrase uh, that, that may exist elsewhere as well. So uh, uh, that is available on the podcast as well, The Surviving Fragments of The Hunting of Cupid. That is available to listen now as a sort of tone poem of the little bits that survive. Uh, and that uh, that uh, is uh, something of an earworm. It sticks with you, it really does. Anyway, uh, I love crossovers. Uh, thoughts about this uh, this little scene? It's it's really I really like this. I think this is a, this is a lovely little little uh, vignette. Uh, Aliki, uh, following Sarah's portrayal of Cupid's toxic masculinity, there, <laughs> <laughs> I really want to do a very handsy Cupid, and the nymph just constantly removing his hand from bits of her anatomy no we don't do that here no <laughs> <laughs> yeah because you know nymph uh, hunting who loves it not you know the the you know uh, the, you know the, the, this is our mission statement we, we we have a lovely old time uh none of this this other stuff not interested in that go away 
Um, yeah, it's not. It, it's not a. Uh, it's it's not a comfortable dialogue uh, in a sense. You know, they are antig antagonists. Um, they might be being relatively civil, uh, but there's a sort of disingenuineness as well to the questions being asked. And there's a lot of questions asked constantly. I, I think in this play, uh, people are always asking questions. Uh, it's almost structured. Uh, I, I don't know actually how far that goes, but certainly this scene is almost entirely made up of question marks. Um, Lois. Yeah, it strikes me that Cupid is sort of disguised. I mean, he, I think, doesn't expect her to know who he is. And then she finally says, you know, your mother, as I guess, is Venus. So she obviously does recognize him. And that may be one reason why he's so angry at the end and determined to show that he is a great god, not a little god. Mm. Yes, and uh, again, with the boys' company, the Cupid could be very, you know, one of the littler uh, members of the company, so it really is a, a, a boy. Um, mm. And yeah, it's just that sort of opening gambit of, uh, fair nymph, are, are, you re are you wandering or are you lost or are you ra ra wandering alone on purpose? You know, <laughs> are, have you had enough of your nymph ways? Would you like to go to the dark? Here, would you like to smoke a cigarette? Um <laughs> It's really, it's what the cool kids are doing. Uh, Eric. Yeah, I was going to say that he's like a really bad door-to-door -door salesman. Sort of going, <laughs> well, <laughs> sort of, um, well, would you like this? I also have sort of like pulling random stuff out of his coat. I also have this and it's like sort of, I don't know, just presenting various things. Um, but it's interesting how, because uh, I, I mean, in mythology, uh, Lots of people have gotten killed over sort of nymphs, uh, sorry, followers of Diana be falling in love with the wrong people or, well, falling in love at all. Um, so it's kind of, <laughs> um, you kind of think that this is going to go terribly, terribly wrong if you know mythology, <laughs> Greek mythology. Well, you know, it's the basic nature of all drama. Something hor something is going to go wrong. That's that's That sums, sums up uh either funnily or unfunnily um uh, we're gonna move on uh we have another short scene uh before a slightly longer one so we'll very briefly introduce ourselves to another couple of characters we haven't met before we're uh, having these relatively short scenes throwing uh, different figures at us uh so that we get to know people so <laughs> enter melibius and philida come philida fair philida and i fear too fair being my philida Thou knowest the custom of this country, and I the greatness of thy beauty. We both the fierceness of the monster Agar. Everyone thinks there is own child fair, but I know that which I most desire, and would least have, that thou art fairest. Thou shalt therefore disguise thyself in attire, lest I should disguise myself in affection, in suffering thee to perish by a fond desire, whom I may preserve by a sure deceit. Dear father, nature could not make me so fair as she hath made you kind, nor you more kind than me dutiful. Whatsoever you will command, I will not refuse, because you command nothing but my safety and your happiness. Uh, but how shall I be disguised? In man's apparel. Oh, it will neither become my body nor my mind. Why, Philida? For then I must keep company with boys and commit follies unseemly for my sex, or keep company with girls and be thought more wanton than becometh me. Besides, I shall be ashamed of my long hose and short coat and so unwarily blab out something by blushing at everything. Fear not, Philida. Use will make it easy. Fear must make it necessary. I agree since my father will have it so, and fortune must. Come, let us in, and when thou art disguised, roam about these woods till the time be past, and Neptune pleased. Um, yeah, uh, I, 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 I particularly like the fact that clearly this is a really obvious idea that everybody <laughs> does. You know, anyone who thinks they have a really beautiful daughter is just going, right, OK. There's suddenly a rush of the sales of the local uh, gentleman's outfitters. Um, you know, uh, they're all hiring out uh, 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 clothes. Everybody's at it. 
I, I also like the fact that Philida just goes, uh, you know, they, they go, uh, you know, fair Philida, thou knowest the custom of, the co yeah. of this country. And just going, you've been paying attention. You read the programme notes in advance, didn't you? Yes. Uh, we did exposition last scene. We were just mentioning it in passing. Um, and, and yeah, I'm, I'm assuming that there's actually a lot of nice, nice little laughs in this scene as well. Just simply the recognition of here we go again. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> or at least that's what I want the audience to do. Uh, thoughts on the room? Uh, Eric, Could it be that Shh, thing of sort of um, when, when, you know, one joke works and then they decide to do it again, kind of, um, and they just do it again and again until it, wor until it gets a laugh? Or is this just sort of more serious plot? Everybody, everybody comes on disguised as a man. <laughs> <laughs> If the, I would All the men like come on disguised as men. <laughs> it's men, men. Uh, everybody's disguised as men all the way down. <laughs> Sarah, there's also a lot of comedy potential in Philida's uh, response because it's just such a marvelous contrast with um, Galatia. You know, Galatia's they're really virtuous and noble and you know heroic, and and. Philida's like, oh, I'm going to have to hang out with horrid boys, <laughs> which is yeah. just, like, <laughs> which is just, and it won't, the clothes won't suit me. <laughs> and it's just, I, just, I was really, really tickled by that because, because, you know, I mean, it would have been funny anyway, but because it's such a contrast with, with, with Galatia, I, I, I just think that's got to be, that's got to be um, done on purpose. Lily, uh, Lily's got to be doing that. Um, as a as a deliberate gag, yeah, yeah. The, the, there's there's no high and mighty question of you know I will sacrifice my you know and I will do it in the best way. Which is, you know, obviously doesn't want to die, but it's just do I have to do all these things to not die? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Alexandra, um, I also really like the the way in which this uh, scene we've we've seen so in the previous occurrence of this of this uh, um, myth, bit of mythology it was very mythological right two scenes ago it was it was mythology or it was an introduction into the fantasy world or or what have you uh, whereas now it's kind of bringing it back down to reality it's like you know everyone thinketh his own child fair it's not that Galatea is the prettiest girl in town it's that she is one of several and all of their fathers are putting them in trousers um, you know which suddenly kind of brings that right down to to the Humber, um, and I thought that was that's 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 a brilliant thing to do, structurally speaking. Uh, excellent. Uh, we do need to move on, uh, so we're going to complete the act. Uh, this uh, whizzing past in so many ways. Um, yeah. Uh, so we've we've got we've been introduced to quite a few uh, characters. We've been introduced to a situation. We've been introduced to some gods. So there's going to be some god additional god mischief. I've actually met some. Uh, minor minor godettes um so or mythological magical things uh we're going to go act a uh, one scene four and we're going to meet a, a very different selection of people now so we enter a mariner as well as rafe robin and dick now mariner what callest thou this sport on the sea it's called a wreck I take no pleasure in it. And of all deaths, I would not be drowned. One's clothes will be so wet when he is taken up. What callest thou the thing we were bound to? A rafter. Uh, I will rather hang myself on a rafter in the house than be so hailed in the sea. There may one have a leap for his life. I marvel how our master speeds. He wore it by this time, he is wet shod. Did you ever see water bubble as the sea did? But what shall we do? You're now in Lincolnshire where you can want no fowl if you can devise means to catch them. There be woods hard by and at every mile to end houses so that if you seek on the land, you shall speed better than on the sea. Sea? Nay, I will never sail more. I brook not their diet. Their bread is so hard that one must carry a whetstone in his mouth to grind his teeth. The meat so salt that one would think after dinner his tongue had been powdered ten days. Oh, thou hast our sweet life, mariner, to be pinned in a few boards and to be within an inch of a thing bottomless. Pray thee, how often hast thou been drowned? 
Who thou seest I am yet alive. Why be they dead that they be drowned? I had thought they had been with the fish and so by chance been caught up with them in a net again. It were a shame my little cold water sh should kill a man of reason when you shall see a poor minnow lie in it that hath no understanding. Thou art wise from the crown of thy head upwards. You <laughs> seek new, new fortunes now. I will follow mine old. I can shift the moon and the sun and know by one card what you all you cannot do by a whole pair. The lodestone that always holdeth his nose to the north, the two and thirty points for the wind, the wonders I see would make you all blind, you be but boys. I fear the sea no more than a dish of water. Why, fools, it is but a liquid element. Farewell. And the mariner tries to go, but... It were good if we learned his cunning at the cards, for we must live by cozenage. We may have neither lands nor wit, nor masters, nor honesty. Nay, I would fain have his thirty-two, that is, his three dozen lacking four points. Eh? For you see, betwixt us three, there is not two good points. Oh, 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 let us call him a, a little bat, that we may learn those points. Uh, Sirrah, a word, I pray thee, show us thy points. Will you learn? Aye. Then, as you like this... This I will instruct you in all our secrets, for there is not a clout, nor card, nor board, nor post that hath not a special name or a singular nature. Oh, well, uh, but begin with your points, for I lack only points in this world. North, north and by east, north, northeast, northeast and by north, northeast, northeast and by east, east, northeast, east and by northeast. Say it. Uh, north, northeast, northeast, nor, nor, and by nor. It. Oh, I shall never do it. This is but one quarter. I shall never learn a quarter of it if I will try. North, northeast is by the west side, north and by north. Passing ill. Hast thou no memory? Try thou. Uh, north, north, uh, 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 and by north. Uh, I can go no further. Oh, Dullard, is thy head lighter than the wind and thy tongue so heavy it will not wag? I will once again say it. I will never learn this language. It will get but small living when it will scarce be learned till one be old. Nay then, farewell, and if your fortunes exceed not your wits, you shall starve before you sleep. And exit the mariner. Was there ever such a cozening? Come, let us to the woods and... See what fortune we may have before they be made ships. As for our master, he is drowned. I will this way. I this. I this. And this day, twelve month, let us all meet here again. It may be we shall either beg together or hang together. It skills not, so we be together. But let us sing now, though we cry hereafter. And they all sing uh, rock shelves and sands and seas farewell. Fie, and who would dwell in such a hell as is a ship which drunk doth reel, taking salt heaths from deck to keel. Up were we swallowed in wet graves. All soused in waves. By Neptune slaves. What, what shall, shall we, we do, do being, being tossed, tossed ashore? ashore? Milk some blind tavern and there roar. Tis brave, my boys, to sell on land, for being well manned, we can cry stand. The trade of pursing near shall fall, until the hangman cry strikes sail. Rove then, no matter whither, in fire or stormy weather, and as we live, let's die together, one hempen caper, that's a feather. Arr! <laughs> etc and they all exit so yes having said that they're gonna disappear and not see each other for a year uh they sing a farewell song because we haven't had a song yet and oddly enough it's the end of an act so is that a marker for everyone to take a, just a, a a wee break to uh, um uh, trim candles or for that matter have a quick wee um so uh yeah there's some I'm fascinated by this play in the different ways you can deliver exposition. Um, it's not just by getting people to ask questions. It's to get people to ask ridiculously stupid comedy questions. I, I just love the idea, you know, 
What was this thing we just did? We got shipwrecked. Oh. <laughs> and what was that thing we were clinging on to? It was a raft. Oh, right. Um... <laughs> <laughs> So it's making fun of of delivering, finding ways to deliver exposition, which uh, is 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 really interesting. I'm, I'm really liking that, Alexandra. I had an opposing theory to that, um, which was that it's it is a comedy setup, but it's in the opposite direction. So it's I need to make I, I I'm I've prepared a joke about it being a wreck. But I can't bring the conversation to it, so I'll just go. What do you call it? What do you call this thing that's just happened? It's a wreck. Thank you very much for feeding me that line. I can now de give, deliver my joke. That sort of thing. Mm. Uh, other thoughts about the, the, the that and the rest of the scene, Eric? It's very formulaic, sort of like the mariner speak. Uh, I don't know, Rafe speaks or whatever, and then Dick speaks, and then the mariner, and then um, Robin, and then you know, it's very much in order. They they. They, they rotate uh, very quickly sort of as well and it just it's, the whole north north and by east bit is just like let's see how quickly you can catch on <laughs> well yeah it's, it's like you know the 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 mariner might get apprentices out of this uh, you know and it's just can they remember basic instructions no uh, uh, yeah <laughs> and it's testing the patience of this mariner as well who's just clearly i mean why he came back the first time uh <laughs> clearly useless. <laughs> uh, other I really liked the vignette, the vignette style of the play so far. I loved the prologue. I think that was a leaky. I think he read it really, really well. But um, I'm loving the vignettes because we move from character, from a group of characters to another group of characters. But there's a tremendous flow to the narrative, which I haven't seen in any of our plays recently. It was pretty really like big jumps between places and people. But this one seems to have quite a nice flow to it. Yeah, it's uh, and it, it's something that we've noticed with Lily is that there tend to be a lot of really short scenes and little, little moments like this, and these are really bouncing along very nicely. Um, and you know, Act One is is you know mostly, shall we say, set up. There's more set up uh, complications to come, um, but it, it's doing it quite nicely. I'm really, I'm, I'm, you know, as once again, it, uh, Lily remains very, very convivial company, um, uh, and and I'm I'm still enjoying this, Eric. Well, also, it's kind of that thing of making fun of people who are landlubbers and know nothing about the sea. <laughs> um, while, you know, they're talking about being near the Humber or whatever. Uh, and obviously, sailing on the river would be different to sailing on uh, the sea, I guess. Um, <laughs> but it's just the whole, the, the actual content of the comedy is funny as well, not just the actual, not just the setup. Mm. Uh, Sarah? Yeah, it, it, it was so funny, the content. That gag about, like, how it seems a shame that, you know, a, a, a mighty man is going to drown in water when, you know, these pathetic little minnows swim around in it all day. I mean, that was just, that was comedy gold, I thought. <laughs> yeah, there are several really pleasing lines that, that, that kept le uh, leading out. Thou art wise from the crown of thy head up. Oh, yeah. um... <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I think, uh, Sarah, you put in the chat the... Uh, Farewell, if your fortunes ex exceed not your wits, you shall start before you sleep. <laughs> I love that line. T-shirt line, definitely. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's always nice when you have sort of overt comedy characters who are actually uh, uh, moderately funny. It's, it's always disappointing when you get, and here come some funny people, and it's not actually funny. So uh, that's, that's nice. Uh, we're going to move on into Act 2. So uh, we're going into Act to scene one, and we have uh, the arrival of Galatea again, uh, alone and now in, in suitable disguise. Blush, Galatea, that must frame thy affection fit for thy habit, and therefore be thought immodest because thou art unfortunate. Thy tender years cannot dissemble this deceit, nor thy sex bear it. Oh, would the gods had made me as I seem to be, or that I might safely be what I seem not. Thy father doteth, Galatea, whose blind love corrupteth his fond judgment, and jealous of thy death, seemeth to dote on thy beauty, whose fond care carrieth his partial eye as far from truth as his heart is from falsehood. But why dost thou blame him? 
or blab what thou art when thou shouldst only counterfeit what thou art not. But just here comes the lad. I will learn of him how to behave. And I neither like my dick. Oh, sorry. Sorry, yes. Uh, so enter uh, Philida in man's attire, an actual stage direction. I neither like my gait nor my garments. The one untoward, the other unfit, both unseemly. Oh, Philida. Oh, but yonder stayeth one, therefore say nothing. But, oh, Philida. I perceive that boys are in as great disliking of themselves as maids. Therefore... Though I wear the apparel, I am glad I am not the person. Ah, it is a pretty boy, and a fair. He might well have been a woman, <laughs> but because he is not, I am glad I am. For now, under the colour of my coat, I shall decipher the follies of their kind. I would salute him, but I fear I should make a curtsy instead of a leg. If I durst trust my face, as well as I do my habit, I would spend some time to make pastime, for say what they will of a man's wit, it is no second thing to be a woman. All the blood in my body would be in my face if he should ask me, as the question among men is common. Are you a maid? Then why stand I still? Boys should be bold. Oh, but here cometh a brave train that will spoil all our talk. Uh, I'm actually going to pause there before we go into the, the, the body of the scene, because uh, there, there's, there's quite a lot to discuss there that I, I, I really like. Um, I, I like the fact that Galatea is continuing to discuss the finer thing, you know, the, 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 the morality of and, yeah. and the, the question of her father. And Philida comes in just going, oh, God, this is awful. <laughs> uh, and he said, uh, I will say nothing. But then still repeats that, oh, <laughs> there's, so there's this lovely and the fact that they don't talk to each other and they, they mean to. And, and, the, 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 and I love the, the, the line from Galatea. If he should ask me as the question among men is common, are you a maid? Um, so that that's speaking to all sorts of things. Uh, thoughts on the room briefly before we go into the rest of the scene. Anybody got any additional thoughts they want to throw in there? Uh, Francis. Yeah, I just like the way um, uh, Philida having first said, oh my God, I've got to hang out with boys. When she gets the chance to, she suddenly says, oh, his chance to learn a thing or two about, about the uh, male sex. Oh, the ironies piled onto ironies there, Eric. Yeah, I was just going to say, this is not going to, it's just like, yes, let's see what we can do <laughs> with, with two boys uh, who are disguised as women who are disguised as boys. This is just going to not <laughs> end well. <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's, it's comedy gold, though. It's wonderful. Mm. This I'm mm. enjoying it so much. Which, mm. sorry, is not a very uh, useful point to make. But... No, no, it's a very useful point. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. identifying bits we really like. Um, <laughs> you know, this is a very detached. Uh, elements of this is very detachable for uh, other material as well as just the play itself. So uh, I'm I'm really liking this. Anyway, uh, I pause mid scene. Let's uh, so. Uh, we've got two people who haven't uh, spoken to each other, but are sort of eyeing each other up as possible fodder to learn what the other sex is like. Uh, but then the scene is confused with the arrival of additional people. Uh, I say people. Enter Diana, Telusa and Eurota. Who's Diana? Ah, Elizabeth. <laughs> What's the fellow? You are deceived, lady. Why? Are you no boy? No fair yes. boy. But I see an unhappy boy. Saw you not the deer come this way? He flew down the wind, and I believe you have launched him. Whose deer was it, lady? Diana's deer. I saw none but mine own deer. This wag is wanton or a fool. Ask the other, Diana. I know not how it cometh to pass, but yonder boy is, in my eyes, too beautiful. I pray gods the ladies think him not their dear. But, pretty lad, do the sheep feed in the forest, or are you stray from your flock? Or on purpose come you to mar Diana's pastime? I understand not one word you speak. What? Art thou neither lad nor shepherd? Uh, my mother said I could be no lad till I was twenty year old, nor keep sheep till I could tell them. 
And therefore, lady, neither lad nor shepherd is here. These boys are both agreed. Either they're very pleasant or too perverse. You are best, lady, make them tusks these woods while we stand with our bows and so use them as beagles since they've no good mouths. I will. Without delay or excuse, and if you can do nothing, yet shall you halloo the deer. I am willing to go, not for these ladies' company, because myself am a virgin. That fair boy's favor, I think me a god. You, sir, boy, shall go, shall also go. I must, if you command, and would if you had not. And they exit. So, yeah, first test. Someone comes up to you and says, Hello, are you a lad? And says, No. Uh, <laughs> and they both do it. And they both wriggle out of it. Um, and, uh, yeah, so it goes from a doe to a deer. Uh, whether it's a female deer, I don't know. Um, uh, so, yes, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, some various playful uh, plays on, on the word deer and deer. Um, in that, uh, thoughts on the complications? Uh, and just, uh, yes, Diana has, has picked them up, as it were, to halloo the deer. <laughs> They're beaters, basically. <laughs> Uh, thoughts in the room? Uh, Sarah? You don't really need to add any comedy to this because it's hilarious already, but you could actually have, like, uh, I just have this vision of, like, a pantomime deer, like, galloping past as just <laughs> just before Diana and her crew came in, just and the pair of them just watch it go pop. Like, <laughs> and then, you know, and they carry on. <laughs> uh, Eric? I like how we went from ew boys to ooh. Well, hello. Yeah, <laughs> yeah there, there's, there's suddenly sort of mid mid conversation with somebody else going. Actually, he, he's quite fit. Uh, <laughs> he's like a god. Uh, so. There's no there's no stage direction, but I wonder is Cupid in this scene actually shooting arrows in the background? Um, well, Cupid is about to appear in the next scene, so, yeah. uh, but that's no reason why it couldn't occur. Um, whether Cupid's aiming at the, the nymphs and misses, because that would be very cupid -y. Um, but, you know, that would make, that would actually make sense, in that sense that Cupid's there to get the nymphs to being a bit haughty in his view. Um, and, uh, and, and so it's them. So that, yeah, that makes sense. Cool. Uh, okay, additional thoughts. Otherwise, we'll go forward into Act Two, Scene Two. Um, just, uh, just note anyone uh, who's got background noise, just perhaps police uh, the muting if necessary. Uh, getting a bit of background sound there. Oh, it's much better. Act Two, Scene Two. Enter Cupid alone in nymph's apparel, and Neptune is listening. Now, Cupid, under the shape of a silly girl, show the power of a mighty god. Let Diana and all her coy nymphs know that there is no heart so chaste, but thy bow can wound. Nor eyes so modest, but thy brands can kindle. Nor thoughts so staid, but thy shafts can make wavering, weak and wanton. Cupid, though he be a child, is no baby. I will make their pains my pastimes and so confound their loves in their own sex that they shall dote in their desires, delight in their affections and practice only impossibilities. Whilst I truant from my mother, I will use some tyranny in these woods and so shall the exercise in foolish love be my excuse for running away. I will see whether fair faces be always chaste or Diana's virgins only modest, else I will spend both my shafts and shifts. And then, ladies, if you see these dainty dames entrapped in love, say softly to yourselves, we may all love. And exit Cupid, leaving Neptune alone. Do silly shepherds go about to deceive great Neptune in putting out man's attire upon women? 
and Cupid to make sport, deceive them all by using a woman's apparel upon a god. Huh. Then Neptune, that hast taken sundry shapes to obtain love, stick not to practice some deceit to show thy deity. And having oft thrust thyself into the shape of beasts to deceive men, be not coy to use the shape of a shepherd to show thyself a god. Neptune cannot be overreached by swains, himself is subtle. And if Diana be overtaken by craft, <laughs> Cupid is wise. <laughs> I will into these woods and mark all, and in the end will mar all. <laughs> Ooh, boo hiss uh, from Neptune there. Um, yes, so we, we have these uh, these uh, two uh, speeches, but they're, they're, they're interacting in the sense that Neptune's been watching. I quite like the idea that Cupid might have been in the previous scene in disguise and only reveals himself at that point. Um, and that the, 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 the action does feel very flowy from the previous scene uh, in that sense that it, yes, it is a separate scene, but it, it effectively, uh, for the audience, it will feel like very much the same place. Um, uh, any thoughts on Cupid or Neptune? Sarah, you seem to be enjoying Cupid. Um... He's a little bastard, isn't he? I mean... <laughs> it's... Ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because you... <clears throat> I, I, I've played Cupid quite a few times and he's always this, you know, he is always a bit of a prankster and he is always kind of, yeah, shit his arrows at the wrong people and getting it wrong. But I, I feel in this play that he's, he's definitely a bit more malevolent than, than, than he is in some of the, the other uh, plays where he's cropped up. He just feels like he's, and, and that last scene he was in as well. I mean, he was totally there at, he was totally there on purpose. You just know he'd been lurking around waiting for that nymph. And and I'm not sure if he's just kind of got some sort of evil master plot to <laughs> take over the world or whether he's just he's just really, really mischievous. And he and and but it, it's kind of it does seem to have a, re a really malevolent edge to it, um, which I'm really enjoying. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting that that sort of dangerousness to Cupid is it I mean, we've touched on that with the other uh, quite a few of the other plays we, we've, we've we seem to have done quite a lot of Cupid of late mm. um you know sign of the times I think um uh, Cupid gets about but yeah there's there's something interestingly uh, unsettling about Cupid in in a lot of the plays that he's appearing in so I'm, I'm really enjoying that Eric I feel like Cupid is a cross between Stewie from Family Guy and Brain from Pinky in the Brain <laughs> Yeah. Sort of like this sort of like <laughs> megalomaniac who's trying to like yeah. make things work and just like nothing mm -hmm. goes according to plan of course i mean i'm, I'm presuming but yeah hmm? you you enjoying that uh hunting there you uh you enjoying going out and hunting hmm? you uh not not interested in sex no 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 just uh just a bit of hunting hmm? yes very nice very nice uh okay yes uh moving on uh lois yeah I was noticing that the end of uh, Cupid's speech is actually addressed to the audience, isn't it? Then, ladies, if you see these dainty dames entrapped in love, say softly to yourselves, we may all love. Mm. Mm. Interesting. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, Neptune is just as nasty as Cupid. I mean, all the gods are like that. I mean, all they're thinking about is their own power and make sure they want respect. They're going to get respect, you know. Yeah, so it's it's gone from a, a general Cupid speech out generally to the audience to a very specific, you know, picking picking some ladies out in the audience there mm. um, moment and uh, and and slightly change, shifting that focus. Helen, I, I think it's 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 important that Neptune is totally not deceived by disguisings. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, the the gods have a have have they they may seem very human, but they have these supernatural abilities. So you know, who who that presumably it's the the human choosers who are going to be deceived. But you know, Diana clearly isn't is 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 not noticing these things, or uh, doesn't appear to, that she's noticing it. So maybe it's not an an equal thing. Or maybe just Neptune is much more suspicious of people. 
or perhaps he's he's concentrating on his sacrifice, whereas she's in the middle of a hunt. Well, you know, I think Neptune probably is just this happens every year. Um, every you know, five years. Always, yeah, but there's always these people are coming in, uh, you know, and they're always in disguise. And, you know, this is this, this is uh, uh, this. This is the kind of evasion that uh, that you get. Um um, yeah, I, I, I've been watching uh, Secret Army about uh, escape lines in, uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in during the Second World War. So this this is feeling very very similar to that. Is starting to uh, take on a lightened uh, uh, view. Uh, so I'm going to move in a totally different direction now, Sarah. Um, sorry, <laughs> it's talking about Secret Army has completely thrown me off my point. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I, I remember what I was going to say now. <laughs> Um, yeah, or it's possible. It's probably not probable, but it is possible that Diana sees through it as well, mm. and and sees a couple of girls dressed as boys and thinks, oh yeah, they'd be they'd be good Diana acolytes. Yeah, we'll take them along. Yeah, it, the the scene doesn't indicate it so far, but that doesn't mean it's not there, and uh, that that there might be evidence for that later on in the play as we go on. So yes, possibly. Any additional thoughts before we move on? No, I see nothing. So we're going to go into Act 2, Scene 3, and this is a little longer. So, uh, as indeed um, with, with a similar encounter earlier. Um, so we are following the adventures of Rafe at this particular point in time. Uh, so enter Rafe uh, from earlier alone. Are you this, seeking of fortunes, when one can find nothing but bird's nests? Would I were out of these woods, for I shall have but wooden luck. Here's nothing but the, the shrieking of owls, croaking of frogs, hissing of adders, barking of foxes, walking of hags. It would be these. I will follow them. To hell I shall not go, for so fair faces never can have such hard fortunes. That's and we'll just pause there. Sorry, I, I missed a stage direction. I apologise. So Leaky acted through it. It was beautifully done. So uh, <laughs> Rafe, has, Rafe has seen some uh, fairies dancing and playing, etc. And then they exit. So there's this big <laughs> moment of just going, uh, should should you follow them? Um, uh, they're, 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 and, and you don't. However, at this point, um, uh, enter the alchemist boy, Peter, who is presumably uh, quite mucky. Hmm. What life do I lead with my master? Nothing but blowing of bellows, beating of spirits and scraping of crosslets. It is a very secret science, for none almost can understand the language of it. S sublimation, al almigation, calcination, rubification, incorporation, circination, cementation albification and fermentation, with as many terms impossible to be uttered as they are to be compassed. Oh, let me cross myself. I have never heard so many great devils in a little monkey's mouth. Then our instruments, crosslets, sublimatories, Kirkubits, limbex, dissensor, dissensors, vials, manual and mural, then bibing and combibing, bellows, mollicative, mollificative, and endurative. Do they speak so? Then our metals, saltpeter, vitriol, saltata, salpurpurat, argol, resiga, sal ammoniac. Agrimony, lunary, brimstone, valerian, tartar, alum, breamwort, glass, unslaked lime, chalk, ashes, hair, and what not, to make I know not what. My hair beginneth to stand upright. Would the boy make an end? And yet such a beggarly science it is, and so strong on multiplication, that the end is to have neither gold, wit, nor honesty. Then I am just of thy occupation. What fellow? Well met! Fellow? Upon what acquaintance? Well, thou sayest the end of thy occupation is to have neither wit, money, nor honesty, <laughs> he thinks, at a blush. Thou shouldst be one of my occupation. Thou art deceived. My master is an alchemist. A 
What's that? A, a, a man? A little more than a man, and a hair's breadth less than a god, he can make of thy cap gold, and by multiplication of one groat, three old angels. I have known him of the tag of a point to make a silver bowl of a pint. That makes thee have never a point. They be all but to pot. I think he can do this. He shall be a god altogether. If thou have any gold to work on, Thou art then made for ever, for with one pound of gold he will go near to pave ten acres of ground. How might a man see him and, and learn his cunning? Easily. First seem to understand the terms, and especially mark these points. In our art, in our art there are four spirits. Oh, oh, nay, I have done if you work with devils. Thou art gross, we call those spirits that are the grounds of our art, as it were the metals more incorporative for domination. The first spirit is quicksilver. <laughs> that is my spirit, for my silver is so quick that I have much ado to catch it. And when I have it, it is so nimble that I cannot hold it. I thought there was a devil in it. The second, orpiment. Well, that's no spirit, but a word to conjure a spirit. The third, sal ammoniac. That's a proper word. The fourth, brimstone. Oh, that a stinking spirit. I thought there was some spirit in it because it burned so blue. For my mother would often tell me that when the candle burned blue, there was some ill spirit in the house. And, and now I perceive it was a spirit of stone. Thou canst remember these four spirits? Uh, let me alone to conjure them. Now are there also seven bodies, but oh, but here cometh my master. And enter the alchemist, who doesn't quite approach them yet. This is a beggar. No, such cunning men must disguise themselves as though there were, there were nothing in them, for otherwise they shall be compelled to work for princes and so be constrained to bewray their secrets. I like not his attire, but am enamoured of his art. An ounce of silver limed, as much a crude mercury, of spirits four, being tempered with the body seven, by multiplying of it ten times, comes for one pound, eight thousand pounds, so that I may have only beech and coals. Is it possible? It is more certain than certainty. Tell thee one secret. I, I, I stole a silver thimble. Dost thou think that he will make it a bottle pot? A bottle pot? Nay, I dare warrant, I dare warrant it a whole cupboard of plate. Why, of the quintessence of a leaden plummet, he hath framed twenty dozen of silver spoons. Look how he studies. I durst venture my life. He's now casting about how of his breath he may make golden bracelets. For oftentimes of smoke he hath made silver drops. What do I hear? Didst thou never hear how Jupiter came in a golden shower to Danai? I remember that tale. That shower did my master make of a spoonful of tartar alum, but with the fire of blood and the corrosive of the air, he is able to make nothing infinite. But whist, he, sp he espieth us. What, Peter? Do you loiter, knowing that every minute increases our mine? I was glad to take air, for the metal came so fast that I feared my face would have been turned to silver. But what stripling is this? One that is desirous to learn your craft. Craft, sir boy? You must call it mystery. All is one, a crafty mystery and a mystical craft. Canst thou take pains? Infinite. But thou must be sworn to be secret, and then I will entertain thee. I can swear, though I be a poor fellow, as well as the best man in the shire. But, but sir, I much marvel that you being cunning should be so ragged. Oh, my child, griffs make their nests of gold, though their coats are feathers. And we feather our nests with diamonds, though our garments be but frieze. 
Thou knewest the secret of this science, the cunning would make thee so proud that thou wouldst disdain the outward pomp. My master is so ravished with his art that we many times go supperless to bed, for he will make gold of his bread, and such is the drought of his desire that we all wish our very guts were gold. I have good fortune to light upon such a master. When in the depths of my skill I determine to try the uttermost of mine art, I am dissuaded by the gods. Otherwise, I dust undertake to make the fire as it flames gold, the wind as it blows silver, the water as it runs lead, the earth as it stands iron, the sky brass, and men's thoughts firm metals. <gasps> I must bless myself and, and marvel at you. Come in, and thou shalt see all. And exit the al alchemist. I follow. I run. I, I fly. They say my father hath a golden thumb. You shall see me have a golden body. And exit Rafe. I am glad of this, for now I shall have leisure to run away. Such a bald art as never was. But let him keep his new man, for he shall never see his old again. God shield me from blowing gold to nothing, with a strong imagination to make nothing anything. And exit, Peter, end scene. Uh, yeah, there's an awful lot going on in this scene. It's really, uh, really interesting, because it's uh, yeah that question of who's... who's <clears throat> conning who um and who's conning themselves let alone conning other people and um uh, uh, and the the way it's all working so yes we've got an alchemist who in theory is turning uh base metals into uh into shiny things and um clearly uh that's that's not necessarily the case even though it is being sold as being that and the way that uh, Peter's listing all the various ingredients and things needed and, and Rafe seeing that like it's a demonic incantation, calling them devil's names. And <laughs> so, yeah, there's all there's a huge amount of interesting stuff going on. Some really very nice, um, uh, nice lines as well. Um, I, I like Rafe talking about uh, silver with him is so quick he can never keep hold of it. Uh, I, I think that's a really, really nice um nice gag and that that does still sort of land i like the fact that rafe goes oh he's one he's like me because there's no honesty <laughs> um you know so yeah there's uh there's uh, uh there's all sorts of things uh who wants to leap in first on this scene possibilities issues questions and i know if people start asking me what do all the, all the individual things mean please please don't <laughs> um, I, I have got glosses. Some of them actually are are, are, are not necessarily fully glossable. So uh, some of them are. Um, so if you really, really care, pull it in the chat. But it's not going to make a dynamic or interesting conversation for this video. Uh, Eric. I was just wondering uh, why. Well, not wondering because um, you were talking about questions. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I was just thinking that while they were reading this, that it reminds me of that scene with the philosophers and the philosopher's servants. From I think it was Kambaspi or something, um, mm -hmm. where they're going. Yeah, my master doesn't give a toss for a piece of bread, and the other one's like, yeah, mine lives in a bucket, and sort of it's very much that dynamic. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, and you know, in in terms of time, it's not that long since uh, since Kambaspi was uh, written by Lily. Um, so you know, it it sort of makes sense that people writers do tend to sort of orbit certain ideas and things and so they get mirrored in in plays that they wrote recently uh so you end up plagiarizing yourself in interesting ways um yes other thoughts uh helen uh, we make a big distinction between scientists and alchemists which wasn't a distinction that would then have been made um I mean, Isaac Newton divided half his, spent half his time, as I understand it, doing alchemy. It's only because none of it worked that we can, we feel free to mock it now. Um, but some of these people actually made 
great um, advice. I, I mean, even if only by proving that certain things didn't work. And a lot of them had government subsidies from, and or ten rate were patronised by members of the Privy Council who were always in hope of getting a gold flow. Yes, the perennial, uh, 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 the perennial need. Uh, a leaky. Um, I was wondering about the golden thumb. I know you said not to ask you things, but that feels like a reference that I'm supposed to get. My father has the golden thumb. You shall see me have a golden body. Is that a pub? Uh, hmm? Could be a pub. <laughs> oh. The golden thumb. Maybe it's like having green fingers. Yeah. Uh, I think it's the miller's thumb, uh, which was used basically to give false weight. I could be wrong, but is his father a miller? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Oh, well done. Yes. An honest miller hath a golden thumb. Yeah. Uh, as a, a a a proverb. So yeah. um, yes, that 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 is what that is referring to. Um, any other questions or issues or thoughts? No. Okay, we will move on. Uh, so. Where were we? Uh, yes, yeah, so we're going to run the next two scenes into each other because they're essentially uh, uh, two uh, monologues from contrasty viewpoints. Uh, so we start off with Act 2, Scene 4, with Enter Galatea Alone. How oh, now, Galatea, miserable Galatea, that having put on the apparel of a boy, thou canst not also put on the mind. Oh. Fair Melibaeus, I too fair, and therefore I fear too proud. Had it not been better for thee to have been a sacrifice to Neptune than a slave to Cupid, to die for thy country than to live in thy fancy, to be a sacrifice than a lover? Oh, would when I hunted his eye with my heart, he might have seen my heart with his eyes? Why did nature to him, a boy, give a face so fair, or to me a virgin, a fortune so hard. I will now use for the distaff the bow, and play at coits abroad, uh, that was wont to sew in my sampler at home. It may be, Galatea, oh, foolish Galatea, what may be, nothing. Let me follow him into the woods, and thou, sweet Venus, be my guide. Exit Galatea, Act 2, Scene 5, Enter Phyllida alone. Poor Phyllida, curse the time of thy birth and rareness of thy beauty, the unaptness of thy apparel and the untamedness of thy affections. Art thou no sooner in the habit of a boy, but thou must be enamoured of a boy. What shalt thou do when what best liketh thee most discontenteth thee? Go into the woods. Watch the good times, his best moods, and transgress in love a little of thy modesty. I will. I dare not. Thou must. I cannot. Then pine in thine own peevishness. I will not. I will. Ah, Phyllida, do something, nay, anything, rather than live thus. Well, what I will do, myself knows not, but what I ought, I know too well. And so I go, resolute, either to bewray my love or suffer shame. And exit Phyllida. So we have two different uh, interpretations of effectively the same problem. Um, and once again, there's the dynamism to Philadelphia. I will, I dare not. Uh, duh, um, it's uh, the, 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 it feels like on just a basic terms that Philida moves more. Whereas I think Galatea sort of glides. Mm. Um, uh, I, uh, uh, and, and, and thing. When we have a hint, I don't know whether we've actually had it explicitly stated earlier um, that they the, the names that they are now going under. Um, so, um, so I, 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 that's an interesting uh, question. Are they they basically taking on the names of their um, of uh, yeah of of their fathers? I think um, so, which I suppose makes sense. Um, 
any any thoughts about the difference between Galatea and and Philida here, uh, Eric? You can kind of imagine that they haven't actually spoken to each other yet. They're just kind of like <laughs> this, each standing on either well, maybe not even either side of the stage or whatever. But uh, whenever they appear in the same scene, they're just like sort of glancing over, <laughs> but not actually communicating at all. Yeah, because they're clearly they're, they're clearly not very confident about doing. The, they get the impression there's more practice going in here. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I, I will now use for the distaff the bow. The uh, play at quits abroad. Want to sew, uh, sew my sampler at home. So it looks like there's a certain resignation to to the the status quo here from Galatea. I don't know if that's fair. Uh, other thoughts. No. No, let's rattle on then. Uh, we have another reasonably longish uh, couple of scenes uh, to close the session. So act three, scene, we're into a new act. Nobody's done any singing there. So uh, uh, that, that feels like a missed opportunity. Uh, anyway, act three, scene one uh, also uh, uh, begins with uh, a certain amount of text. So uh, from uh, Toulouse alone. Oh, no. What new conceits, what strange contraries breed in thy mind? Is thy Diana become a Venus? Thy chaste thoughts turn to wanton looks, thy conquering modesty to a captive imagination. Beginnest thou with Pirelis to die in the air and live in the fire, to lead the sweet delight of hunting and follow the hot desire of love? Oh, Toulouse, these words are unfit for thy sex, being a virgin, but apt for thy affections, being a lover. And can there, in years so young, in education so precise, in vows so holy, in a heart so chaste, enter either a strong desire or a wish or a wavering thought of love? Can Cupid's brands quench Vesta's flames, and his feeble shafts headed with feathers pierce deeper than the Diana's arrows headed with steel? Break thy bow, Toulouse, that seekest to break thy vow, and let those hands that aim to hit the wild heart scratch out those eyes that have wounded thy tame heart. O oh, vain and only naked name of chastity, that is made eternal and perisheth by time, holy and is infected by fancy, divine and is made mortal by folly. <laughs> Virgin's hearts, I perceive, are not unlike cotton trees, whose fruit is so hard in the bud that it soundeth like steel, and being ripe, poureth forth nothing but wool and their thoughts like the leaves of a of lunary, which the further they grow from the sun, the sooner they are scorched with his beams. O oh, Melibaeus, because thou art fair, must I be fickle and false my vow because I see thy virtue. Fond girl that I am to think of love, nay, vain profession that I follow to disdain love. But here cometh Eurota. I must now put on a red mask and blush, lest she perceive my pale face and laugh. Uh, enter Eurota. Lusa, Diana bid me hunt you out and saith that you care not to hunt with her. But if you follow any other game that, that then she hath roused, your punishment shall be to bend all our bows and weave all our strings. Why look ye so pale, so sad, so wildly? Eurota, the game I follow is the thing I fly. My strange disease, my chief desire. I am no Oedipus to expound riddles, and I muse how, that, how thou canst be sphinx to utter them. But I pray thee, Toulouse, tell me what thou ailest. If thou be sick, this ground hath leaves to heal. If melancholic, there are, here are pastimes to use. If peevish, wit must wean it, or time, or counsel. If thou be in love, for I shall have heard of such a beast called love, it shall be cured. Why blushest thou, Toulouse? To hear thee in reckoning my pains, to recite thine own. 
I saw, your rota, how amorously you glanced your eye on the fair boy in the white coat, and how cunningly, now that you would have some talk of love, you hit me in the teeth with love. I confess that I am in love, yet swear I know that I know not what it is. I feel my thoughts unknit, mine eyes unstayed, my heart no I know not how affected or infected. My sleep's broken and full of dreams, my wakeness sad and full of sighs, myself in all things unlike myself. If this be love, I would it had never been devised. Thou hast told me what I am in uttering what thyself is. These are my passions, Eurota, my unbridled fashions, my intolerable passions, which I were as good at acknowledging and crave counsel as to deny and endure peril. How did it take you first, Toulouse? By the eyes, my wanton eyes, which conceived the picture of his face and hanged it on the very strings of my heart. Oh, fair Melibaeus, oh, fond Toulouse. But how did it take you, Eurota? By the ears, whose sweet words sunk so deep into my head that the remembrance of his wit hath bereaved me of my wisdom. Eloquent, Titerus, credulous, Eurota. But soft, here cometh Ramia, but let her not hear us talk. We will withdraw ourselves and hear her talk. And they move out of the way and hide themselves. Enter Ramia. I am sent to seek others that have lost myself. You shall see Ramya hath also bitten on a love leaf. Can there be no heart so chaste but love can wound? No vow so holy but affection can violate? Vain art thou virtue, and thou chastity but a byword, when you are both subject to love, of all things the most abject. If love be a god, why should not lovers be virtuous? Love is a god. And lovers are virtuous. Indeed, Ramya, if lovers were not virtuous, then wert thou vicious. What are you come so near me? I think we came near you when you said we said you loved. Hush, Ramya, it is too late to recall it, to repent it a shame. Therefore, I prithee, tell me, what is love? If myself felt only this infection, I would then take up upon me the definition but being incidents to so many, I dare not myself describe it. But we will all talk of that in the woods. Diana stormeth that, sending one to seek the other, she loseth all. Servier of all the nymphs, the coyest, loveth deadly, and exclaimeth against Diana, honoureth Venus, detesteth Vesta, and maketh a common scorn of virtue. Clymene, whose stately looks seem to amaze the greatest lords, stoopeth, yieldeth, and fawneth on the strange boy in the woods. Myself, with blushing I speak it, am thrall to that boy, that fair boy, that beautiful boy. What have we here, all in love, no other food than fancy? No, no, she shall not have the fair boy. Nor you, Toulouse. Nor you, you wrote her. I love Melbiusi, and my desert shall be answerable to my desires. I will forsake Diana for him. I will die for him. So saith Clymene, and she will have him. I cannot. My sweet Titerus, though he seem proud, I impute it to childishness, whom being yet scarce out of his swathe clouts, cannot understand these deep concepts. I love him. So do I, and I will have him. Immodest, all that we are, in unfortunate, all that we are like to be. Shall virgins begin to wrangle for love and become wanton in their thoughts, in their words, in their actions? O oh, divine love, which art therefore called divine, because thou overreachest the wisest, conquerest the chastest, 
and does all things both unlikely and impossible because thou art love. Thou makest the bashful impudent, the wise fond, the chaste wanton, and workest contrar contraries to our reach because thyself is beyond reason. Talk no more, Toulouse. Your words wound. <sighs> Would I were no woman. Would Titus were no boy. Would Toulouse were nobody. And they exit. Yes, there's chaos in the nymph kingdom. <laughs> uh, Diana's losing all, all the nymphs there. They're all in love. Um, and it's starting to feel very much like a, 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 a 1950s science fiction film. What is this human emotion you call love? I don't know how it works. What do we do? Ah, are you in love? I'm in love too. I love the way that the sidling up of, um, of you know, uh, of going, oh, you look pale. Are, are, are you in love? Yeah, I'm in love too. Ah, I don't know what to do. Um, so, yeah, it's a... It's a really interesting scene. Yeah. Cupid's obviously been busy. I mean, we were talking about was Cupid in that earlier scene, so maybe Cupid was just standing there, just going, -dum, 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 uh, and just taking everybody out, and they all are in love with Galatea uh, and Philida, uh, variously, and because uh, basically they're the 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 only uh, the the only options uh, uh, within uh, this definition of uh, of those you can love. Um, Helen. Have we worked out yet whether Philida or Galatea is wearing the white coat? Um, I haven't, but I should be able to figure that one out in a moment. Um, basically, uh, Titurus is Galatea and uh, Melibus is uh, is uh, Philida. So I think I think one is blonde, one is brunette, one is wearing a white coat, and the other is so far unspecified. Who, who was who their was... coat is uh, Galatea, right? Um, according to the footnote that I'm looking there, so uh, opinions may vary. Um, in white. Uh, okay. Yes. Uh, additional thoughts, uh, Alexandra. So I uh, thought when we stopped between after the first two short speeches, Galatea and then Philida, um, I was thinking uh, this is really nice as a as a contrast in in how they're set up, you know, in, in direct um, succession. But of course, the, the whole point is the entire sequence, including Toulouse and all the nymphs that are in love. So that again, we're going from the virtuous sort of the um, uh, um, virtuously minded Galatea going, oh, gosh, isn't it, that falling in love would be a very bad idea right now to Philida, who's got a much more kind of, uh, you know, practical, earthly sort of perspective to the nymphs who are utterly ridiculous or, in, or you know, increasingly ridiculous in the as, as the scene goes on. Um, so, again, it's taking that that very noble or that that um, uh, romantic idea of what what love should be and then just bringing it back to reality. <laughs> Yeah, it, and it's really interesting, the nymphs, the way the nymphs are talking about it, you know, how, how did you fall in love? It was through the eyes, it was me through the ears. The other one talking about it being an infection, um, uh, you know, and, 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 you know, they're not used to all these, these, these emotions. So what do they do with it? They, what, do they, what do they do with it? They're nymphs. This, this is, this, they vowed not to do this. They're supposed to be out hunting. Hunting's their thing. Um, other thoughts? Uh, Eric? It feels very like something you could set in a high school, kind of like girls fighting over the same person. But obviously, the 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 sort of um, what's called uh, in this case, the same person is basically another girl who's dressed as a guy. Instead of fighting over the jocks, for example, they're fighting over <laughs> um, two really cute guys, trans people. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, yeah, uh, are the thoughts we've got one more scene to go uh, very briefly, but uh, Helen, then Sarah. Um, yeah, I get the impression that the nymphs have been put into this state of love by Cupid, oh, yes. but that Philida and Galatea, it comes from themselves, not from Cupid. That, I'm happy with that. Is that what other people think? 
Yeah. That seems reasonable. Because yeah. mm. Cupid's got no beef with them. Um, no. You know, Cupid is deliberately seeding chaos in Diana's troop, and her troop is, you know, her her her, her gang is 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 breaking apart because of this love thing. Um, Sarah. It, just what Eric said about uh, setting it in a high school, it suddenly, I suddenly realised what this reminded me of. It reminds me of, of that plot uh, device that gets used in many different series, TV series. I was thinking of Buffy the Vampire Slayer, but it's, it happens in Star Trek a lot as well, where they suddenly all end up in an alternate universe where all the good characters are suddenly bad and all the all the innocent characters are suddenly sexy and all, you know, and, and, and oh, everybody gets to play the exact opposite of themselves for one episode and then it all gets back, put back at the end. And I, and I suddenly thought, I mean, the, a lot of these, nips, this is the first time they have dialogue, but it would be quite fun, I think, if earlier on, maybe that scene where Diana first appears and accosts the two boys, where we see these nymphs in their usual state. So even if they don't have dialogue, like they, we, we see them sort of being their, their kind of very effective um, hunting, you, you know, nymph selves, focused, laser focused on the hunt, you know, kind of no nonsense just so that we make the most of this contrast that comes, which is very funny anyway, but I, I just think maybe there's more there's more to be had out of it if we set it up earlier in the, in the play. Uh, we've got one more scene to do. Um, and again, I think it's useful to just uh, hang on uh, uh, Alexandra's point earlier of uh, these scenes flowing into each other. So we've just had a scene with all the nymphs being in love and talking about the people that they are in love with and the people that they are in love with now enter for Act 3, Scene 2. And of course, they're in love with each other, but uh, they're all confused. Let's see how uh, Philida and Galatea cope with Act 3, Scene 2. It is pity that nature framed you not a woman, having a face so fair, so lovely a countenance, so modest a behaviour. Uh, there is a tree in Tylos whose nuts have shells like fire, and being cracked, the kernel is but water. What a toy is it to tell me of that tree being nothing to the purpose? I say, it is pity you are not a woman. I would not wish to be a woman, unless it were because thou art a man. Nay, I do not wish thee to be a woman, uh, for then I would not love thee. Um, for I have sworn never to love a woman. A strange humour in so pretty a youth, and according to mine, for myself will never love a woman. It were a shame if a maiden should be a suitor, a thing hated in that sex, that thou shouldst deny to be her servant. If it be a shame in me, it can be no commendation in you, for yourself is of that mind. Uh, uh, suppose I were a virgin, <laughs> I blush in supposing myself one, and that under the habit of a boy were the person of a maid. If I should utter my affection with sighs, manifest my sweet love by my salt tears, and prove my loyalty unspotted and my griefs intolerable, would not then that fair face pity this true heart? I admit that I were, as you would have me suppose that you are, and that I should with entreaties, prayers, oaths, bribes, and whatever else can be invented in love, uh, desire your favour, would you not yield? Tush, you come in with admit. It weren't you with suppose. What doubtful speeches be these? I fear me he is as I am, a maiden. What dread? Dread? riseth in my mind, I fear the boy to be as I am, a maiden. Tush, it cannot be. His voice shows the contrary. Yet I do not think it is, for he would have blushed. <clears throat> have you ever a sister? <laughs> if I had but one, my brother must needs have two. But I pray, have you ever a one? My father had but one daughter, and therefore I could have no sister. I mean, he is as I am, for his speech is as be as mine are. What shall I do? Either he is subtle, or my sex simple. 
I have known divers of Diana's nymphs enamoured of him, yet hath he rejected all, either as too proud, to disdain, or too childish, not to understand, or for that he knoweth himself to be a virgin. I am in a quandary. Diana's nymphs have followed him, and he despised them, either knowing too well the beauty of his own face, or that himself is of the same mould. I will once again try him. Uh, you promised me in the woods that you would love me before all Diana's nymphs. Aye, so you would love me before all Diana's nymphs. <laughs> Can you prefer a fond boy as I am before so fair ladies as they are? Why should not I as well as you? Come, let us into the grove and make much of one another that cannot tell what to think one of another. Exuant. <laughs> That's an in, a, a, a closing gambit to uh, to to go with. Um, yeah, so much so much fun. Uh, to be, I, I I just love the opening gambit of just going. Uh, it's such a shame you're not a woman, and the other one just going. Um, um, um. Think of something to say. Think of something to say. I'm in a wood. Uh, there, there's a tree. <laughs> um and and you know uh getting picked up on that and 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 yeah the 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 way they're dancing around each other and i i think what i'm really liking is the way that people try to say what they mean by searching out what they think the other person wants to hear and 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 that that roundabout way of talking that that people have when they they don't want to uh, to give away too much and and put themselves out there and 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 it's it's really really nicely done and then those, those asides one after the other where you can see them sort of go talking to each other and then i have to do an aside now they know what i know and then the other one does it as well and then they do it again and and it's like this this multiple domino asides um and you can see the heads going standing there <laughs> <laughs> um it's it's yeah it's very playable again um and all of these uh galatea Philida scenes or, or speeches are flowing very nicely into into them with little progression in between eric um uh, it just reminds me of this very um what do you call it a uh, very modern um series on netflix called one day at a time where uh there's one of the ca main characters is uh non-binary is is a girl who basically discovers that you know she's interested in women and generally people uh, <laughs> who are not male um and <laughs> she just kind of doesn't know how to flirt so what she does is uh tries to offer a cookie and so it goes you know if the person uh, accepts the cookie it means that they they they, they you know th the other person is you know interested which is very leads to very you know sort of problematic issues because obviously you know if you get hungry and you want a cookie then it doesn't necessarily mean you're not straight um, <laughs> and it just feels like that kind of dancing around everything sort of yeah very awkward teenagey kind of energy <laughs> I also like the performance of uh, trying to perform uh, male uh, with Philida's line. I suppose I were a virgin. <laughs> I blush in supposing myself one. <laughs> God, not. Um, which is really nicely done. Uh, other thoughts, Alexandra. Yeah, I feel like uh, what would what would make this. Um stronger as a, a in in terms of its impact on us as an audience is the is the very um high stakes is the understanding of of the, there being very high stakes to to either of these two being personal stakes uh, to them being revealed um as as women so um because i think we're, we're taking it we're having a lot of fun but um it needs to be that you know it's it's more than life and death uh in terms of those moments where they each of them goes um i'm i'm totally i'm totally not a woman but if i were um you know because it's we've had we've just had a scene where all these other girls are are fawning over these girls who are boys and it's all been a bit of a, a bit of fun but if we lose the fact that that there has to be something very important behind this then otherwise this scene just is silly but but it's not it's just silly it's not impactful uh lois 
Yeah, presumably the nymphs are not eligible to be monster food, uh, so they don't have to worry about people knowing that they're nymphs. But uh, uh, yeah, what you could do, I suppose, in a production is have people elaborately setting up the platform on which the girl is going to be standing when the, the, the monster comes for her and big signs, you know, come and see monster devour her beautiful maiden and, and so on. If all that was going on in the background, then uh, they could keep looking nervously at it. Yes, because, uh, you know, we, we, we had uh, stated that there is, you know, this specific tree uh, for, for the, uh, the, the, the sacrificial, uh, sacrificial. Is it still on stage? Is this a permanent feature somewhere? Or, um, you know, because it seems to be a special tying up ready for the monster tree as opposed to, uh, you know, other trees that are available. And can we see the wood for the trees uh, in, in a stage setting sense? Yeah. That is not expectant of any kind of actual answer. Uh, we're into final thoughts um, from the room. So I'm going to go round uh, the play so far, about halfway through. Uh, Francis, how have you enjoyed the journey so far? Um, with me, the jury's still out on this one. Um, there's so many characters in it um, and so many uh, shifts of pace and, um, and scene. Um, I'm not quite sure what to make of it. Although individual bits of it I really like, uh, particularly Philida, she's a very, um, she's the most appealing character for me. Okay, uh, Eric, final thoughts? Well, um, yeah, I think it's quite interesting because so much of it feels very, very modern in terms of, well, not so much like the getting, you know, disguising your daughter in order to protect her from getting sacrificed but the the rest of it where you've got sort of the the interactions between the nymphs and the disguised girls it just feels very modern and it's quite fun so far although you know obviously it's the high, high stakes for you know, they're trying to save protect their lives yeah it's interesting i i, I, I was questioning about the stakes about you know the whether that that initial impulse of of how much that is actually holding on being held on to as as we've gone into act two and act three um because it, it hasn't been i don't know if it's been reiterated that much and it's an interesting question about how present that is for the audience i think it's important there's very pleasant character terms about the stakes as, as alexandra was talking earlier i'm just wondering what the play is interested in at this particular moment but uh, yes, there's still more more evidence to come. Uh, a leaky final thoughts. Of course, we I, I haven't stated the usual thing. You know, we're thinking about you know what would one do with this today. Um, it's feeling on the whole actually very do doable today. There's very little that's uh, that's sitting there going uh, no that 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 needs to go. Um, so yeah, a leaky. Uh, to answer the question that you did ask, I'm a bit wondering about Neptune, who came on and is about. Um, taking his payment in the form of, of beautiful maidens. So maybe he can sort of be made to reiterate it a bit. Um, I, I'm, I'm just enjoying it so much. There are so many comic scenes and I can't wait to see where it goes. So. Excellent. Um, we, we've had sessions before when you know, the first session or so of a player and gone, oh, I'm really looking forward to see where this goes. And uh, and then crushing disappointment lands at a great, great, great weight. So I'm hoping I'm hoping we won't have the curse of the final session uh, for this uh, this play. Uh, Alan, final thoughts? Yeah, I'm enjoying the wordplay. Um, you know, I don't think we've had this sort of level of um, wordplay and you can see it going over quite well with a reasonably well-educated audience um, particularly the sequence with um, Peter and Rafe um, with all of these pseudo-scientific terms being rattled off at great speed it was almost reminding me of um, well there's two or three things in it which are reminding me of Gilbert Sullivan because you're almost getting into a patter song type routine with some of that. One thing I think that would be helpful if we go to a second read on this would be to put some additional notes in the dramatis persona in terms of the relationships and also the bits that we were alluding to earlier in terms of the costuming of the two lead girls when they're in drag. Um, just so people can get a clearer idea of who the devil is who. 
Yes, it is an interesting note that the that their names, they never explicitly say it at some point. I am now, my name is, ta-da. Mm. Um, uh, it, it, it's inferred from dialogue yeah. around it. And that is a, a minor structural thing that is slightly unsatisfying because um, you, you kind of want to make sure the audience definitely knows that they're talking about them uh, mm. when you have all those nymphs talking about them because there isn't really much set up for that. Well, I, I think you've got the costume clues, which again are indirect in terms of narrative, in terms of dialogue, yeah, which could be picked up. But they're, they're, they're very slight. Uh, mm. I mean, when someone asked, when you were asking me earlier about, you know, uh, who's in the white and uh, I, I hadn't even noticed that that was said. Um, so it, it's 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 very um, it's very tenuous uh, in that sense. I mean, in terms of the patter stuff, it was interesting. Uh, I was thinking back to uh, sort of, sort of earlier uh, the Tudor, earlier Tudor uh, uh, tradition of uh, coming on and just doing long lists of things, mm. uh, and that 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 really sort of, uh, especially with a, a, a boy company, uh, that's uh, that's something that has a, a good old uh, heritage to it. I mean, talking about educated audience, I mean, it's not actually that full of classical. Uh, references is you know that most of the classical references are to the people who are in the play. I mean, mm. it's it's mm. not it's not overwhelming a modern audience with 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 stuff. Um, so uh, it that isn't a, 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 a an issue as such. It's just something to, perhaps to note. Uh, uh, Elizabeth, final thoughts? Yeah, I'm I'm enjoying the play a lot. I like the cast of characters. I like the ensemble. I like the way we change the characters every scene. I like how short the scenes are. They're not really like long and dragged out, so I like that as well. Um, I think it's one of those things where the first session goes really well, and then we'll see like where the play goes in the next sessions. Um, are we doing this on Wednesday or is it on Monday or Tuesday? Uh, we will complete it tomorrow. So uh, okay, so I'm gonna miss that. Yeah, but uh, it's always recorded, so you can always you can always watch it back. back. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, the flow of the scenes. I mean, this is something that Lily does uh, quite nicely, uh, and and it, but it is also staying on point. As of yet, I'm not detecting characters that are, we don't know yet until tomorrow. No. Characters who will just randomly disappear. Um, so I'm hoping that uh, we won't have uh, some of those uh, uh, sort of, uh, hanging hanging edges that we've had occasionally in the past. Uh, Lois, final Yeah, I thoughts. love this play. I think it's Lily's best one. And I have seen it a couple of times. Uh, I think once in pretty much ideal conditions done by Edwards Boys, you know, from the grammar school in Stratford, where it was absolutely delightful. You know, in a way, it's hard to imagine uh, any performance that could really have the same effect. Uh, and then I've also seen it done. Um, this was at a conference on uh, pre-duck drama where uh, there was a group that was, uh, they all had different ideas about which pronouns they wanted used about them. And they'd worked out theories about each character that, you know, which ones were transitioning to what or which ones were what. And uh, uh, that certainly gave some of those scenes a completely <laughs> different effect, as you can imagine. Uh, uh, it's a it's a play that very much lends itself to you know to a lot of things that uh, uh, modern actors and audiences are interested in. Mm, yes, uh, Sarah. Final thoughts. Yeah, well, just to follow on from that, um, as as someone who's made a lot of queer theatre and is always very interested in engaging with with those themes, I am absolutely loving this. Um, I, I missed the second Lily play. I, I, I remember thinking that the first one we did, Campaspe, was really very easy to stage for a modern audience. And I think this one even more, and I would love to have a crack at directing this because it's just so gorgeous. And um, I mean, it's funny, yeah, but also just going back to something that um, Alexandra said about this just final scene that we've done about the stakes being higher. I, I I was personally getting the vibe, and maybe it's the gloss that I I put on it, but I was getting the vibe that um, the stakes were just naturally higher because these two do genuinely love each other, and the fact that this scene comes after all the nymphs with their hilarious, you know, crush crushers, um, you know, Cupid inspired, um, you know, kind of 
fainting fits um, about love. I, I just thought there was something really genuine then in, in that scene. It was funny, but it was really sweet. Um, and I, I found it really affecting. And, and that for me raised the stakes because I just thought there was this beautiful relationship developing between them. Now, it's funny what you were saying, Rob, about, you know, then the, the, the end turns out to be disappointing because I have, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I didn't I'm say a... the end does. I was just, uh, the, the, it's, it's, it's it, been it does... known to happen. It's, I'm, it's... I'm, I'm, I'm not projecting. Uh, that, 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 that's that's not actually my, my expectation. It's, it's been known to happen. Um, and... I, I, I'm just assuming that I'm going to be horribly disappointed tomorrow because like what I'm seeing as this really beautiful relationship developing between these two characters, I assume is is not gonna, um, you know, come to fulfillment. I, I, I don't know though, but like I, I, I'm just loving it. And I'm, I'm, you know, you've got all, you've got all these different versions of love going on. And, and there just seems to be something very, very genuine and authentic in, in these two. And the fact that they are both, you know, disguised as the opposite sex and, you know, what Lois was saying there about, you know, you can play with pronouns, you can play with names. Oh, I just think it's great, this. And I think it's well ahead of its time. And I'm I'm going to be really interested to see how, how it turns out tomorrow, whether I'm going to be disappointed or whether by some miracle there's actually going to be like a... The, the kind of ending that I would I, I would want if I was watching it as a modern audience member. I, I, I make no predictions, but uh, I, th I think we may be in for a reasonable shout. Uh, Helen, final thoughts? Uh, yeah, I'd like to say something about the set. Um, I think that the big tree in the centre of the stage is there throughout. I think we've got a one set play here. It's on the banks of the Humber, the Humber, which is a, an arm of the sea and is subject to storms, is where the shipwreck has happened. I think that the, it's the edge of the, the wood into which they go to discuss, discuss transgender issues. I mean, it's all, um, I, I think that the, the, that big tree in the center is, is still there. And I think is a constant reminder. I love the idea, I forget whose it was now, that a certain amount of um, structure, you know, a scaffolding being built and people are actually doing things that reinforce it. Um, the other thing I thought of, think about this certainly so far is that we have two completely separate plays. We've got the love play with uh, the nymphs and with the two girls disguised as boys. And we've also got the uh, Rafe looking for a new master, uh, deciding against being a mariner and now trying out as a, a trainee alchemist. And it, there doesn't seem to be any connection at all between the two strands. Ah, but uh, if he wants to be an alchemist, then that's all about changing from different states. He said uh, whether that is a, a reasonable uh, uh, thing or just something I just plucked out of my... Uh, 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 somewhere. Uh, well plucked. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, I have a go. Uh, Alexandra, final thoughts? Um, I uh, have some thoughts on how apparently... Um, heteronormative and and um, homophobic the world that of the story is and um, how that kind of contrasts massively with the lightness of of the dialogue um, and I think what's important in a modern production is to find a way of um, making it understandable to an audience uh, that these are not statements you know, this, this is not a, an assumption that the world nowadays is or should be like this. Uh, because, every, you know, love can only be between a man and a woman. And um, it, 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 that's why you, you only get the, the nymphs falling in love when there are boys around um, and all this stuff. It's, it can be, there are some really, really beautiful, very interesting things that, that this play kind of allows for exploration for in a non- uh, all of those normative ways, um, and I'd, I'd like you know I'd like I would like to see those things explored and and brought forward in a in a production um, because they they are addressed very gently by the text. 
I would not like to feel as though, as a viewer, I would not like to feel as though it's preaching to me in, in one direction or that it's kind of um, an attempt at innovation that then it gets pulled back into, but we have to end this with marriages that are all between men and women. So I'm waiting to see what happens at the end before I have a fully formed opinion is what I'm saying. Yes, as ever, uh, we've we've been in a number of plays, uh, plays going in dark, uh, uh, depressing directions and uh, plays going in other directions where the question of, well, we can't really comment on precisely what this play is doing until we know what the ending is doing. Mm. Um, and so I'm very much looking forward to what people think of the ending. I know how it ends. Uh, some of the people in the room know how it ends, but many of them don't. And it's that look of surprise, shock, horror, um, uh, or, or that, 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 that sort of indigestion face that sometimes appears mid-session uh, that, uh, that I always look forward to in fact frankly this is the only reason i uh, I, I run these sessions is just simply to watch uh, watch the, uh, the the surprised reactions uh, that come out um uh, either from uh, benign or, or, or malign uh, influences uh, so we have one more session to uh, find out and to surprise those who are available to be surprised uh, uh, as to the ending of Galatea by John Lilly uh, all that remains is to thank everybody in the room at the moment for all their wonderful uh, sterling activity and goodbye bye, bye. bye.